All right, so let me start our already time. Uh, Ponashree there? Hello, Ponashree. Yes, yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, okay, I'll talk to you in the exercises uh, about some comments. Okay, 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 sir. All right, so last time, you know, I was recalling some basic facts about uh, linear maps and the characteristic polynomial, minimal polynomial. And I want to recall it. I want to stress that first. That is so very important. And this will also fit very well. In what Nitin's comment that. How do they come from? Where do they come from? And why are they defined the way they are defined? That is very important to understand. All right. And why did some theorems were proved? what was their importance and so on. All right, so what are they saying? So I have a vector space V, K vector space. And we have this algebra attached to that vector space and K. These are also called algebra of linear operators. K linear operators on V. And the whole linear algebra course centers around studying this algebra. And uh, I, uh, I already defined an algebra earlier. This is a non commutative algebra when the dimension is at least 2. And what I was defining, I was trying to define you what is the characteristic polynomial, what is the minimal polynomial. And so let us let me put n equal to the dimension of many of the things will also make sense for not necessarily finite dimensional spaces. But let me uh, stick to finite dimensional first. All right, so I am going to define this is an algebra over k, so I'm going to define a map from the polynomial algebra kx to the endomorphisms. And the map is, I just have to give because I want to define a k algebra as k algebra homomorphs. And you know, therefore, I only have to define it for x. And then automatically polynomial will go to the distributive law and then use it and then that will give you definition for the polynomial. So then this is actually the universal property of the polynomial algebra. That will allow us only to give values on the variables. So X goes to F. So this is called an evaluation map. Evaluated at F. Epsilon F or EF. That is the map. That is X and to F. And therefore, where will the polynomial go? So therefore, the polynomial FX will go to F of F. That means you are plugging in for X equal to F. And remember, if the polynomial is A0 plus A1X plus 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 a m power x power m, then this goes to this a zero i d v plus a one f and so on plus 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 a m f power m and the powers of f means the composites. So this defines a map from this and obviously it is a k algebra homomorphism the way we have defined it. We don't have to check that because it's a universal property of the polynomial algebra. It's a universal property of the polynomial algebra. What is the image? Image of image of this evaluation map. It's precisely the subalgebra of n generated by f. 
that is this. That means all polynomials in that operator f with coefficients in k. That is obviously the the image of this. And this is obviously a commutative algebra. This is commutative because powers of f commutes with f. So this kf, this is kf, which is the image. This sits inside this, and this is commutative. So this also is advantage because if you are studying only one operator at a time, then you can reduce this uh, endomorphism whole full algebra. Instead of that, you can work with this sub algebra, and then you still have commutative. That is very important. All right, and we are interested in the kernel. So kernel of epsilon uh, E F. This is obviously an ideal because it's a ring homomorphism. This is ideal in the polynomial ring in K X one variable over a field that all of you know it is a principal ideal domain. And therefore, every ideal will be generated by a unique polynomial. Unique, if you choose it, monic. Otherwise, you can find many generators, as many as there are elements in the field. So, and first is note that this kernel cannot be zero. This kernel is non-zero. I say that is because this is infinite-dimensional k-vector space, and this is n. In the finite dimensional k vector space the dimension of endomorphisms of k v over k is n square therefore it is finite dimensional this is infinite dimensional so this map which is a k algebra homomorphism which is k linear also and therefore that map cannot be injected because otherwise this will be a subspace of endomorphisms which has infinite dimension or not possible subspace of a finite dimension is finite dimension therefore this kernel is non zero and therefore it is generated by a non zero polynomial and if i choose it to be monic that will be unique generator so i will record that here the unique generator the unique monic generator of kernel of EF is called the minimal polynomial of F. And denoted by mu F. And therefore, what we know is this kernel is generated by that polynomial mu f. All right, and what did Kelly Hamilton theorem says? If you look at chi f, this is the characteristic polynomial of of f. This is monic of degree equal to dimension of the vector space. And this is easy to compute. Mu is more difficult to compute. And what Kelly Hamilton and Kelly, so, so Kelly Hamilton. We say that chi f belongs to the kernel of E f. That simply means chi f evaluated at f is zero. Okay, first little comment about Kelly Hamilton. First, Hamilton proved this theorem. Hamilton proved this. Hamilton proved this in 1864. Very nice. Uh, you should see this article of Hamilton in 1864. He proved this theorem for four dimensional vector spaces because he was a physicist and he was working with Minkowski spaces. And 
we wanted to know how do we decide whether a linear operator is invertible or not. How to give a criterion for invertibility of a linear operator. That is where he proved that if the characteristic polynomial constant term is non-zero, then it is invertible and not only invertible, he could find the inverse at once. That was the starting point. So then Kelly later on generalized it to arbitrary and dimensional vector spaces and so on. All right. So now this belongs to the kernel means what? And kernel is generated by mu f. Therefore, immediate consequences mu f divides chi f. And whenever you have a division statement, you should always write where in kx. But this statement is not very sharp enough. So I will state a theorem which is very sharp and which is very, very important. Okay. But before that, just I want to ask you a couple of questions. So for example, suppose I give you a matrix. So let us say a matrix A. A is a matrix, a diagonal matrix let us say. A1 to A. What is the minimal polynomial? Can somebody answer? So x minus a1, uh, x minus a2 up to x minus a n. That's not true. For example, suppose I take all a is to be 1. Then what is the minimal polynomial? The name matrix A is the identity matrix. And what is the minimal polynomial? Uh, x minus uh, 1. Yes. But your answer was x minus 1, x minus 1, x minus 1, n times, no? So when AIs are uh, distinct. Yes. And what happens if AIs are equal? Some AIs are equal, some A1 equal to A2, and A3 equal to A5, or A3 equal to some other. And then how do you calculate? That is my question. All right. So that is a good exercise for you. I just want to point out in uh, this preliminary uh, discussion lecture that many things one feel that they know it, but actually they only know the calculation. And that what is missing is the concepts. All right. So let me continue. So the important theorem I was mentioning was the following. So this theorem is very, very important and it is used very often. And all this setup you will actually find in Jordan, the book 1870, in this format actually. And the later books are, you know, they became only the calculation books. So one should read older books. All right. So uh, the theorem is F is an endomorphism. Finite dimensional as usual our assumption. N is the dimension. Then, minimal polynomial of F and characteristic polynomial of F have the same prime divisors. In Kx. That means you should spell out. What does that mean? That means chi f, chi f is easier to compute. This is monic, so I can always write it in the form pi 1 power alpha 1, pi 2 power alpha 2, and pi r to the power alpha r 
where pi1, pi2, pi r are the distinct monic irreducible polynomials and alpha 1 to alpha r they are non zero natural numbers that is the prime factorization of if in kx and when i say prime then that means irreducible monic irreducible polynomials are prime making monic monic is always very important all right then the minimal polynomial will look like pi1 beta1 pi r beta r same pairs they are distinct monic and alpha1 is bigger equal to beta1 bigger equal to 1 and so on alpha r bigger equal to beta r bigger equal to 1 that means only these multiplicities differ and that is the statement this is very very important statement so what is the image i am not going to prove this this you must prove in your linear algebra course how many of you have seen these theorems proof hello i just just to get an idea how many of you have seen the proof of this titi yes yes sir i have seen the proof you have seen the proof in your course linear algebra sir very good who else has let me ask you the negative question who has not seen it rahul hello rahul hello sir have you seen this proof earlier uh, yes sir in the linear algebra course in what in linear algebra course all right in what was the reference book uh, that vivek sai and best that was the reference i i am not able to hear you your voice is splitting hello yes uh, uh, sir the book was uh, by linear algebra by vivek sai and vikas best okay yeah <coughs> all right so immediate consequence is very important here very important result immediate consequence of this if you look at the zeros of characteristic polynomial and when i say zeros where in the closure so in the algebraic closure so k bar fix an algebraic closure k bar is an fix algebraic closure every field has an algebraic closure you know and when you take the zeros there they are all zeros are there and so this one and minimal polynomial will have the same zeros only difference will be their multiplicities will be different so these sets are different and only the multiplicities are different and this this one is called eigen eigen values of f in k bar all of them may be not there in k but they are in k bar definitely all of them and similarly this one this is very very important this result is very very so that is called i i denoted by i or i it's better to call it this is called the spectrum of the linear operator f spec f this is also called actually more specifically it is called eigen spectrum of f again because uh, when your operator is not finite dimensional there and there are other spec there are other values which are called spectral values 
So anyway, we are not going to go into that. This is the eigenspectrum of the operator F. All right. So now I want to come back. I want to come back to what I defined last time. So what we were, I wanted to give examples. So what was that? This was this I started doing it because I wanted to answer so this definition. The sesquilinear form. Sesquilinear function. Here. It def the, to that sesquilinear function, I have defined two canonical semilinear maps, phi1 and phi2. phi1 concern the fixing the first variable, and phi2 concern the fixing the second variable. So these we have seen that phi1 and phi2 both are semilinear. They are very canonical, and their ranks are equal. And from both of from any one of them, we can recover the Cisco linear map function by this formula. So therefore, if you want to study Cisco linear function, I will define this phi uh, define any one of them and get information about the Cisco linear function. That is the philosophy. All right. And then we have noted that both of them have the same rank, and that rank is called the rank of the Cisco linear. That rank is called rank of F uh, phi. Now I want to study two very important cases that when both are injective or both are bijective. And then if both are injective, one calls it is a non-degenerate sesquilinear function. And if both are bijective, then one calls it a complete duality. These concepts are very important in studying, for example, projective geometry. All right. Unfortunately, we cannot go on. So I wanted to give example and the trace form. I want to give an example. So all these I did it because of the trace form. All right. So what is the trace? Trace of a linear map. So now characteristic polynomial. As we saw, that is a degree n polynomial, so it looks like this. Plus a zero and we saw that if chi f at zero. Is a zero and this is plus minus determinant of. Depending on any one odd and so on. And this one. So all the all the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial are very important in variants. So one of them is this a naught that was the determinant. The other is this. And also the middle ones also, but they will be a little bit more difficult to compute. But definitely a n minus one is not so difficult to compute. So what is what will be a n minus one formula for a n minus one? That will be equal to minus all these eigenvalues. Summation of eigenvalues. Summation of uh, lambda. And this lambda is running over uh, v k bar chi f. And you will have to count them with the multiplicity also if they are appearing with multiplicity. So that is that is called a trace. But again, this is a trace of x. All right. But I so <coughs> so that is trace is. I think I have to write minus somewhere. So this is minus. So trace is uh, the way I remember is uh, this is equal to minus of coefficient of x power n minus one. So I may have made a mistake here. So this is the trace. And we want to study this better. And get into more. This trace has 
many, 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 many important properties. And it comes in lots of applications. All right. So. Well, I will define more generally now. More generally. I want to define trace. So if I have V finite dimensional, then I am defining a map from N KV cross N KV to, to K. Any operator F here, another operator F here, and map it to trace of H. FG means F compose. So this is a trace. Trace. Form. Remember my convention when I use the word form that is from the same V W equal to V. It's a sequilinear function with W equal to V. Then you call it a form. And it is uh, I will just simply write that this is a uh, uh, symmetric bilinear. It is linear in both variables. So bilinear form one and a more. So it gives me that fee. Where is that fee? It gives me the fee. This C. This C. It's a form. And uh, we don't have to say SSP because we are taking identity. The, the conjugation we are taking to be identity. That's why it is by here. So just to remember, just to remember, put somewhere here. This is the case where kappa is IDK. So it's symmetric by this. So this you will you may have to use the properties of the trace, the standard trace. So uh, should I recall that or assume that? Hello? Take Hello, Titi. Assume that. Assume that, fine. Now one more comment before I go on. I will check that this uh, this defines a complete duality. So trace form defines a complete duality on endomorphisms on these vector space. That is what I want to check. Complete duality means again going back here. That is the definition. That means both phi1 and phi2 are bijective. And what are phi1 and phi2? What are phi1 and phi2? We know here, we know here explicitly. Phi1 is what? Phi1 is a map from V, that is endomorphisms of V, to the do all of that. And what is the map? Any F going to the dual. So it should send G to trace of FG. And I want to check that this map is a bijective. This is what I have to check. And the proof is not so difficult. But I will check it because it is not that trivial. All right. So uh, before that, before I check this, I also want to make one definition or maybe let us check directly. Let us check. All right. So proof. So, 
So I want to check this map is from this vector space to that vector space. And this vector space has dimension n square n. All right. So that means I should have a good basis. See, all linear, all throughout linear algebra, you know your calculation will be pleasant if you have a good basis, if you have chosen a good basis and not work with the arbitrary basis. So the choice that one makes a good basis, that is very important. All right, so what is the basis I'm going to take? So basis I'm going to take, so ERS, given any, I will be sketchy here, but uh, it will be clear. So I will be my set 120. And for any R and S in I, I have this ERS. What should be ERS? ERS is an endomorphism of V. Which endomorphism? So if I have to define a basis, uh, define a endomorphism, I just have to define it on a basis. So take any basis, fix any basis. So fix x1 to xr basis of me. And uh, you take ERS evaluated at xj equal to delta sj xr where delta sj is chronical delta mm, sir number yes. of basis elements should be n right oh yeah this n this is n not r R is already there. R and S is fixed. So this is N. Thank you. So these are like matrix units. No, what is the basis of MN, MNK? They are matrix units. IJ position 1 and everywhere else it is 0. And that is the basis. That is a good basis. Exactly that. I have written in terms of the map. So that is the basis. So this is a basis. So ERS is a basis of N K and R and S are in between one and N. So they are N square. And there is a dual basis. This is a vector space. This is a dual of this vector space. So there is a dual basis. So obviously the dual basis I will denote by E E R S dual. This is a dual basis R S in I. This is a dual basis of N K V star with respect to the basis ERS. And I want to check this, this, uh, this phi one is a isomorphism. So I should check that basis go to basis. Which basis? This ERS basis go to this basis. If I could check that under that trace form, then it will be a bijective map and therefore trace will define a complete duality on the endomorphism of it. That is the. So what should I check? I should compute therefore. I should compute what is phi1 of, let me write now EPQ. Where P and Q are arbitrary pick two elements in I. And then I am interested in checking this actually. I will write down this is equal to 
पी क्यू पी स्टार If I could check this, then we are done. And shall I leave this to you? I would say check this. Check. You will have to see where the trace is hidden. All right. so i will not uh, spend more time on this but i will remark one very important remark i want to make here is the following some of you might get confused with this trace so this is a comment for that all right so so if i have a finite dimensional k algebra so let a b for finite dimensional kj for example this and this is a finite dimensional kj is finite dimensional vector space therefore finite dimensional k algebra definitely all right so the, if suppose it is a finite dimensional k algebra then for an element x x in a i have this linear map lambda x this is from a to a this is linear map any, any y goes to x y this is k linear map and therefore uh, therefore trace of lambda x makes sense this is the trace of lambda x which i will keep calling trace of x that we know how to do you write down the matrix of lambda x and sum the diagonal elements and take the negative sign so this is equal to minus of A I I I is one one to n if it is n dimensional and this A I I this is the matrix A I J this is the matrix of lambda x with respect to some basis and these are the diagonal guys and the minus of them that is the definition of our trace trace of a linear map. Because the characteristic polynomial, this coefficient, that will be the, when you compute the characteristic polynomial, precisely the this, this is the trace. So I think the minus sign should not be there. Really? Uh, yes, sir. Because see, when well, for example, to, we'll settle it for once and all. Suppose you have to expand this polynomial. What will it be? X square minus one plus two x. No. So for polynomial, we have to put the minus sign. But while taking the sum of the entry uh, diagonal elements of matrix, we generally take the, only the sum as trace. Without so the. So what will be, what will be the trace of one one? That will be one. So. So it so should be. It should be no minus sign. Fine. Uh, yes. So there should not be any minus sign. Thank you, Sonakshi. So there also you may be have to correct here. No, there sir. That is true. 
a case of uh, characteristic polynomial okay, when okay, we okay. Yeah. right so that is the trace of a lambda x and now i define a map phi phi from a cross a to k any pair x y goes to trace of x y and by definition trace of x y is trace of lambda x y and this is lambda x compose lambda y so this is trace of this is this is called let me erase this phi and this i want to denote by trace a k this is the trace of that k algebra finite dimensional k algebra so the remark i want to make is the following that note that this is for you to check note that for a equal to the endomorphism of v linear operators on v this is a k algebra this is finite dimensional the trace form so this is called a trace form of the k algebra a remember i have used the algebra structure because i have multiplied all right note that for a equal to endomorphisms the trace form this tr a k is different from the trace form on the k vector space and k see what was the trace form on n k v this was a, a trace form it's a composition all right now just let me make one comment why is it different all right for every endomorphism f in n if i take trace k of this this will be equal to n times trace f where n is the the dimension of the vector space this is easy to check you please check that and see that these two are different things see that n n is the dimension when you have especially the finite field that n the dimension will play very role compared to the uh, characteristic of a field and therefore it will not have the full rank the trace form in the field in the field theory that is algebra this is it case of finite dimension algebra there that characteristic will be also involved so that's it but this is very important to check you check and the only way to check is write down the matrices with the good basis and check that in this case we have already checked that this map is an isomorphism so the rank is full all right so with that i will stop and uh, now i want to give more example which actually
come from a physics. So the next example, these are the concepts which are born after all this discussion. These are called gradient of a linear. This will this comes in analysis also. And uh, if you see the physics books, they they draw the pictures. And when when they draw the pictures, it's exactly like what when we draw the pictures in supplement one and uh, exercises after that. In affine spaces. So for them, vector spaces were affine spaces. That is uh, because they didn't want to fix the origin. Origin was fixed depending on the application or choice. All right. So uh, and after that, we will go to orthogonality. That means the perpendicular. All right. So we saw that if you have a finite dimensional vector space, finite dimensional k vector space, then this duality, the natural duality v cross v, v cross v star to k, this is a natural map, evaluation map. Any x form of phi goes to phi x and we saw this is a natural duality this is actually complete duality this is a complete duality you can check that also you can check the map phi 1 and phi 2 they are bijective And precisely when you want to check this, what will involve is a dual basis. That is why it is called a duality and complete. All right, now the concepts are defined here. Non-degenerate and complete duality. They are equivalent in our case because finite dimensional vector space. In a finite dimensional vector space, if both are of the same dimension, then both Oh, injective will imply surjective. So therefore, this if your dimension of V equal to dimension of W, then uh, 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 non-degenerate is equivalent to saying complete duality. All right, but the definition I have to give more generally, be, more general because later on it is used for non not necessarily finite dimensional vector spaces. All right. So that so, what does that mean? Actually, what is the Gram's matrix in this case? In this uh, v v star, the Gram's matrix is actually the identity matrix. If you choose dual basis. So in so let me write down the Gram's matrix. Uh, what was the notation G? with respect to the of this uh, evaluation map of the dual basis x and x x star this will be actually the identity matrix e n e i this is the identity matrix Therefore, that is the way one checks that these uh, phi 1, phi 2 are both bijective. All right, and what is phi 1? Phi 1 is a map from V to V star and one more star. That is how our phi 1 is defined. And that one is any x here, it goes to that evaluation at x. Think of this is a map, this is a map from V star to K. 
any fee into fee of x. Please note the difference between when I write my small fee and capital fee. In mathematics, notation is very important. And what is C2? C2 should be map from V star, that is W, to star of this. This is a nice map, this is identity map. So in particular, what I'm saying is the following. This is the in particular, the, this remark from this, I want to bring out uh, the remark, which is in particular, for every linear form, phi, from V star to K, There exists a unique vector x in V such that phi of f, phi is defined on f. This has to be evaluation f of x for every f in history. Unique. And this x may depend on this. This is independent of phi. This x independent of phi. That is very important. In case of in case of V, if it is not finite dimensional, so that also is important remark. So let me mention, if V is not finite dimensional, then this V, the natural duality. Is non degenerate but not complete. All these things are very easy to check, you would have checked them sometime. And this is not, but not, but this is never complete actually. Never. In case of not finite dimension. You saw in case of a finite dimension vector space, this map even is only injective, it is never subjective. You can always produce linear forms which are not coming from the vectors. All right. So the same thing now, I, whatever I wrote here, that doesn't happen only in this example, in finite dimensional case, that happens in every example. So that is what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is more generally, if phi is from V cross W to K, defines a complete duality then one can use phi1 phi1 is from where to where phi1 is from v to w star
and phi2 this is from w to v star one can use these bijective maps they are bijective because we are assuming they are complete duality to identify so that means every linear form should come from a vector and unique vector which will depend on the depth so for every f in w star there exist unique bijective vector xf which will depend on the depth in v such that that f the linear form will be phi fixing that vector this dash and then the dual uh, the the conjugate and similarly so this is the surjectivity of this and similarly for this for every g or for every phi every phi here every f here that i have done so for every small phi this will be phi dash unique vector y in w will depend on phi and i don't have to take the bar because already it is you know the the way we have defined the map in general here i am not assuming k as the co complex conjugation k may not be identity in general so it is this now what are the, these vectors are so important xf and y phi in general physics so this xf 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 is called the gradient of f and this y phi is called the gradient of of phi and therefore they are denoted by so this one therefore should be denoted by grad f and this one will be denoted by grad so we get nice formula now what do we get f equal to phi1 of grad f and phi equal to phi2 of grad f this all right now if i had more time i would go more into this and calculate some examples etc but not right now but this needs some checking this is a routine checking you would have done but probably not in this language so if you have time please go through this definition and uh, maybe in the next two lectures if i have some time i will come back to more i am going to come back more examples Uh, but uh, because i want to draw right now uh, pictures so i will first come to orthogonality orthogonality or perpendicular relations and perpendicular relation so as i said in the beginning when we started this uh, in a, our fine geometry or projective geometry that we didn't have a concept of perpendicularity and to define a concept of perpendicularity i need a form form means is fine 
capital phi. And now I want to define perpendicularity with respect to that one. All right. And now this orthogonality actually has origin in the Euclidean geometry. The way we fed Euclidean geometry in our college days or school days, that had that an axiom. We didn't bother about it. We kept saying, we assumed that. That is because we were only associated with the fixed basis that is standard basis of Rn and the standard form. See, we had the standard example of a standard form, no? When we started, there was the example of a standard form. And that standard form not only real, but also complex numbers, because that is why we had to take the bar. And this was given to us, standard. Everything was standard, so we didn't bother about going in a little bit more general, uh, more general setup or different. So, but uh, when uh, when you study more mathematics and uh, problems which are coming from physics, this is uh, necessary. All right. So when do you say, so now what is given to us? We had we have given two vector spaces V and W. K vector spaces. And remember on our assumption on K. Assumption on K is that Kappa is identity. That is one. And Kappa is not identity. And then element we are writing conjugate. This is and also here now now onwards I will also assume that characteristic of the field is not true. Remember, this will correspond to studying symmetric bilinear forms. Not only our real numbers or complex numbers. Also. And this one will correspond to study Hermitian forms. And this is definitely for complex numbers and not real numbers. And similarly, not only symmetric, skew symmetric also. And not only Hermitian, the skews Hermitian also. And my point to do all this together is because all these four cases we are going to study at once. All the theorems, what we will prove, it will be all together. Because our notation is set up correctly and the definitions are correctly and because of that. Now, I will just define and stop in uh, two, three minutes. So, and then we have this given phi. This is a sesquilinear function. Sesquilinear function. That means it is linear in the first variable and semilinear or kappa linear in the second variable. Where where kappa is identity, then it is linear in that variable. So, so it will be bilinear. All right. Now, what do I want to define? I want to define the following. So that is the definition one. X is a vector given in V. Y is a vector given in W. Then I want to say that X is perpendicular to Y. If phi of x y zero, and in this case we will write notation x per with respect to phi y. Or it's simply when the, not this small phi, I should have written capital phi. Or simply x per y when when that is fixed. All right. Now the first question is: Is this a symmetric relation? Or what kind of a relation is this? That is what one wants to study. 
and that will put some condition on the form and the appropriates will come out of that and not only that i can define more generally now so this definition i can uh, define it more generally when we have a sub subset m in v and subset n in w then when will i write m perp m perp all the vectors in w y in w such that m is perpendicular to y and when i write this that means every vector in m is perpendicular to y similarly n per and now where do i write you see here i will write this on the right left side because i am going to write the, those elements on the left because our phi is this is all those x in v such that x is perpendicular to n and this of course i should write it otherwise sonakshi will ask me tomorrow what do i mean by this so this means x is perpendicular to y for every x in n similarly the other this means x is perpendicular to y for every y in n now next time when i come i think you will give me the answer what kind of a relation is this perpendicular relation so we have defined a relation from if you want from the set v to the w or from w to v and when is it when is it symmetric one would like relation to be nice relation equivalence relation for example so all right so i will stop here if you have any question please ask me otherwise i will send this Uh, file immediately to Onashri and Makran, and they will pass on to you. And tutorial is coming up. I hope you have done some problems without uh, doing exercises. Mathematics cannot be studied. this is lecture 22 okay ponashi i send you the file okay sir i will stop this presenting